Hi, Anthony. Welcome to our sessions. And please, <laughs> you're free to talk about something cool. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, thanks everyone for, for being on the call. Um, you know me, for anyone else watching this, uh, I'm Anthony Fox Davis, CEO of System Seeds. Um, I've got a bit of a background in project management and operations before running the company. And we're going to be talking today about MVPs and other acronyms. So part of the reason for this is um, you have different acronyms, different um, terms used, and they're often interchangeable, but, um, or rather people, people misuse them when they, when they use them as interchangeable. So we're going to shine a light on exact uh, definitions and we're going to um, get a bit more in depth into some of the most important parts. So let's learn about proof of concepts uh, versus prototypes versus MVPs. We're gonna talk about what they are and what they are not. Um, why would you build an MVP? And uh, what to factor in? So just getting a bit more in depth with some of that stuff. So proof of concept versus prototype versus minimum viable product or MVP. Um, here we can just, we're trying to create a basic, concise definition of each one. So if we look at the first one, a proof of concept, a proof of concept shows that a product or feature can be done. So uh, we'll, we'll get a bit more into that in a second. So can something be done is a proof of concept. A prototype is how will it be done? And an MVP is a, a minimal form of the complete product and something that provides you some metrics as well. Uh, I've started to include memes because Ev doesn't like uh, slideshows and presentations that don't have memes in them. So we need to go deeper, Ev. It's a tasteful meme. Right. Proof of concept. Let's talk about that in more, more depth. So a proof of concept does help you establish whether an idea is worth considering. It does not consider usability or design. So an example of that is um, having gathered data about what others have done to increase their revenue. So we can see from our competition that when they um, offer extra items in the checkout process, the average order amount in their e-commerce store goes up, something like that. So that is data gathering, proof of concept is data gathering to show what you can do. Uh, not how you're going to do it, just what you can do. Um, another example would be user feedback. So if you run focus groups, if you talk to your users, they can tell you what they want. That can be a very strong indication of not what you can do, but what you should be doing. So that's proof of concept. Prototype would be a working model for internal use. And it's not really meant for use in production. So if you ever hear proof of concept and prototype, don't think production. And prototype is the only one that is a real model. Proof of concept is just data stuff. So prototype is a working model for internal use, not meant for use in production. Um, an example of that could be a user interface that you demo in Sketch or Zeppelin. That would be a prototype. No one is going to use Sketch or Zeppelin in production for something. Um, or that's like a sort of a front endy sort of GUI example. Um, a back end sort of example would be a script that can demo something, but it isn't really already designed for production. It's, it's a start for what you could potentially do in production if you change it a bit. So um, it's, it, it's a working example. A prototype is a working example. Um, minimum viable product. This is, um, this is the one that we're going to spend more time on today. And uh, it's the most interesting for a few different reasons. So um, you can remember what the others are. The, um, the proof of concept is data related. The um, prototype is a working model and the MVP is something that we'll spend more time, more time on. So it's a minimum form of the complete product and it solves a real core problem for a set of users. So by this time, you've had a proof of concept that has shown you what you should.
and you're going to get it out to people and you're going to solve the problem like one of the one of the problems that you've uh, uncovered so what it isn't is all possible features if you're putting all possible features into an mvp then it's not an mvp mvp should be a reduced number of features and it is not just functional and i'll get back to that term about um functionality in a bit um and the release this is quite important so what you should be able to verify through running your mvp should be is if something is technically feasible so it's possible to do on a technical level and that can mean uh whether it it, it is feasible within a certain constraints right so like a certain amount of time imagine you've got six months or a year to build the software and someone says i can show you a, a proof of concept or a prototype for ai but could you actually get it out in an mvp within five years if you say your constraints are one year then maybe it's not technically feasible um it should also verify hypotheses from the team so you set your hypothesis when you're building an mvp and you try and show whether the hypothesis is is correct or not and um usability engagement and market demand for the product those are those are two separate things they can overlap a little bit usability engagement um would be we have seen that users engage with the thing that we've created in the way that we expected them to engage and so usability could be um it, it, that example again from the e-commerce checkout once we introduced extra items they could put in their checkout at the very last point people did include them and therefore it proved our hypothesis that adding that ux would would bring value to the business value to the product uh, market demand for the product is the other one so if you're building a product um you you help prove your product um uh, uh what do you say your product market fit so um pr proving that people actually want what you're building uh, not sure if this is actually all that helpful, but I saw it when I was um, uh, looking at research for MVP. You can basically turn anything into a Venn diagram, so don't pay too much attention to this. But if you think of um, what is the absolute minimum you can do, this should be really small. If you think of the absolute minimum you can do when you're talking about your product and what is viable to do, we're only trying to do that bit in the middle. So everything else is waste. And if you create minimum stuff um, that isn't very good or, or viable, it's what nobody actually wants. And um, this is what you want to try and achieve, but you need to get it down to a, an, an absolute minimum. Um, more wise, so why would you build an MVP? You, you're trying to win over stakeholders. You're trying to strengthen a business case for what they're doing or, or a, a business case for what they uh, are trying to achieve in terms of longer goals start an iterative process so starting with an mvp always sets you up for good iterative agile processes instead of one big waterfall project um, and allowing for the evolution of the product based on that idea of measuring and based on the idea of giving users what they want rather than what stakeholders are trying to implement but uh, potentially without good reason um, and invest more intelligently uh, based on knowledge, based on data, et cetera. Another meme for Ev, um, don't remain precious about aspects of your MVP. It's not what it's about. Um, it's very easy to get into the weeds, into the detail and get stuck there, even when you are uh, a professional, even when you're, you're, you're trying your best to make things minimum, uh, a minimal uh, viable product. And um, there are ways to avoid it. So we'll talk about some of that in, in a moment um, another venn diagram this one isn't quite so bad so I'll, I'll talk about this one for a moment um, the word constraints that i used before is probably what people should keep in mind when doing any development um, bearing that in mind is is necessary in small projects in mvps in large projects etc if you don't introduce constraints nobody else will introduce them for you um, everything will explode we'll all die in a big fire um, but re really like a lot of people show this to help introduce the idea of constraints to clients and they say this to a client, they say, you've got time, quality and cost. Do you want it quick? Do you want it cheap? Do you want it good? Choose two. Um, 
it's interesting because with an MVP, you should be quick to market. You should be doing something that is cheap enough to build. So it's low risk for the client. But if you're saying, okay, I'm going to choose quick and cheap, it means that quality would be cut. But nobody wants a shitty MVP. So let's focus on time and cost, but retain most of the quality by stripping back features. So um, in trying to keep the quality in most of what you deliver to the user, you can cut on things like all possible features, right? So you're going to try and get all of the features that people have been talking about so far down to uh, a more limited set. Um, focusing just on a few things and um, prioritizing which of those you choose, we'll come to you in a moment, um, is going to help you uh, prove the business case, prove the product market fit, um, prove the long-term investments that the business is likely to make in building that product, um, prove growth, revenue, etc. Um, you can cut on things like how scalable it is. An MVP itself does not necessarily need to scale because if an MVP proves everything it's setting out to prove, it's fine to do a, a refactor after the MVP. But you shouldn't be building things like all possible refactoring in to the MVP process itself. So cut down on the number of features you're trying to achieve so you don't cut quality too much. Cut down on scalability because that isn't cutting down on quality and you're still focusing on time and cost. Um, cutting down on things like test suite coverage, there are other ways to avoid writing too many bugs in. So, um, you know, a, a good test suite is um, good for very high, high scale apps. And uh, if something explodes and your, your uh, MVP goes really well, and it's really taking off, you know, you, you would step beyond the MVP to tackle certain things involved in that brilliant explosive growth that people would want. Uh, test, the test suite coverage would be one of those things that you can introduce later. Um, refactoring, you don't need all the latest code in your code base if it's secure and it can be pushed for an MVP, again. Um, you may still want to do things like peer review. Um, peer review is obviously proven to show that uh, fewer bugs make it into production, and that's great. It's, it's not that we're ever going to cut quality in terms of um, how code is written, although you focus on time and cost. And so how do you get there with a lower budget in, in quick time to market while still having a peer review process? Um, and given that you know, we've got choices to make here, being pragmatic, if, if we're gonna try and cut back on something like test suite coverage, you don't want to cut back on that and peer review and uh, risk what, what that could introduce. And um, other things that you would still probably do is, uh, one of those things could be slicing. So we'll come on to slicing. What is slicing? You might have seen variations of this diagram before. So um, you can see that there is things that are feasible. That is like a utilitarian, it's just functional way of looking at things. Whether it's valuable, so actually provide something to the user. So most things that are utilitarian have to do something which actually delivers uh, delivers a benefit of some sort. Um, so can it be done? Is it worth doing? Um, is, it, is it easy enough to use? And is it really nice to use? And obviously these are shown as being different sizes and I think that is a, a correct form for this diagram. You know, it could be a pear shape, it could be a triangle, whatever. But um, in slicing, you don't slice this way. So you don't try and take, this, this example would show, um, more features, so more things that are feasible. You try and take few things that are feasible and make them feasible, valuable, usable, and actually really nice to use. But you take a small number, so try and slice uh, vertically. Um, it helps make sure you don't put all of your effort in just one area. Um, an example might be if you built an amazing loading screen that was fully animated, like real sort of fireworks and space stars, I don't know, and, and really delightful, and your MVP did nothing else, it wouldn't verify all the aspects that an MVP is supposed to help you with. 
I'll remind you of those aspects. They are technical feasibility, proving hypotheses from the team, usability engagement, and market demand for the product. So you can see that just creating something delightful is as stupid as trying to just create something feasible. Um, so your slicing basically has to happen this way. Um, put the same amount of time, time and effort into building a nice front end that is usable. And I just say nice, not incredible, not you know, mind blowing, but nice, it's usable, delivers something the user gains value from and actually works well for you as the uh, product owner as well. And you're doing, you're doing your job correctly. So what features to include? Um, obviously this is a question to be considered in depth. I think um, a lot of this presentation is supposed to highlight some of what should be approached and it shouldn't be a, a be all and end all into uh, this sort of process of um, discovering uh, what you should build into an MVP and deciding on priorities, et cetera. But um, this, this part, what features to include would be a very in-depth discussion with the client, um, potentially without the client in, in an internal team before engaging the client or before engaging with users. Um, but to get the right stories in the backlog, um, you really want to consider this well. So um, deciding what features to include can be helped along by something like a prioritization matrix. Um, so this doesn't just apply to MVPs, but whole products. Um, in that case, you probably want to review this, uh, review features in this way on a semi-regular basis, like every month or every few sprints, every couple of months. Um, and we'll talk through it. And, and, and sometimes you see these um, shown off and, and, and sort of structured in a slightly different way, but I'll, I'll talk through the differences. So on your um, x-axis, you've got value. So low value stuff, high value stuff, and the value is to consumers and to the, um, the, the business case for the product. So that is usually your client's business case if you're an agency. Um, value is assumed from doing things like the proof of concept through uh, the prototype. You can gather real data uh, to build your hypotheses and that's gonna help you plot some of the different ideas or features on this matrix. So you do have to make some assumptions or presumptions um, through different exercises that you can go through to help plot value. Um, on the y-axis is how hard it will be to implement. So very difficult, super easy. Um, that's regarding everything. So that isn't just how hard it will be to program a particular feature in a particular module, you know, in a particular uh, piece of software. It might be how difficult it is to have the conversation with the client. So if the client is not going to be receptive to certain things, the ease of implementing that thing becomes difficult. Even if it's a half hour programming job, if that is a discussion the client doesn't like, if it is um, something which is going to become political, if it, if it could actually be things that are based on things you cannot change. So you could potentially change a client's mind, right? You could structure the conversation well, you could listen to them, you could um, empathize, you could help teach them in a very soft, friendly way and win them over. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to become easy. It might be based on things like um, uh, the design of it would be incredibly hard to get the design right and finished and deliverable. It might be because uh, you could be dependent on third parties. So um, I think we've all had experience with horrible APIs. Uh, nobody in the system seed mentioned which names they are, but you know, th th there can be things that maybe almost completely out of your control. And so you need to factor in the ease across the board, strategy, design, development, support, but maybe not the support, but um, to, to implement something to push it uh, is not just about how hard it is to program. So um, sometimes this, um, this graph is shown with uh, a crosshair in the middle. And so the axis overlap in the middle here and in the top right hand corner, people say do this first. In the bottom left hand corner, they say do this never. And then it becomes up to a big discussion as to do things in the top uh, left and the bottom right. This is a nicer way of slicing it, I think. 
because if things are floating towards the top right, then you do want to take uh, that as your next step. And you don't have to deliberate again and again and again over whether you're going to go for something over the top left or the bottom right. So um, I, I prefer this way of slicing it. You'll see other graphs where there's just uh, a crosshair left and right in the middle of that. Um, okay. So we've um, we found a way to prioritize features. What else is required to ensure the M MVP can verify? I'm just going to go over these again. Technical feasibility, hypotheses from the team, usability engagement, market demand for the product. How are we going to meet those, uh, those goals for the MVP? Uh, we should ensure that we are checking the technical feasibility plan uh, removes what can't be done yet. So um, let me think about an example for this. Basic, basically, respond to new information that comes to light. So if you, if you go in believing that your technical feasibility is, um, is possible, um, it gets through your, um, your feature prioritization, so the prioritization matrix, and it's something you start off on and new information comes to light, you should be able to reprioritize that and say, this may not be technical fe technically feasible, or it may not be where we expected in the prioritization matrix. We may have to revisit this at another time. And it might be fine to, um, to split certain things that you're doing. So you end up building part of the thing and not the whole thing. Um, if that helps you out with your technical feasibility. Um, ensuring that your hypothesis includes measure, hypotheses, plural, includes measurable data points. So your MVP should be built in such a way that you can measure the effectiveness of um, what you set about in your hypotheses to try and prove. Um, usability should follow on from hypotheses. So you should write hypotheses in such a way that you, know, you should be able to structure something in order to show that X. And your UX and your UI people should be looking at that, those hypotheses and saying, okay, so we know that those goals are set. How are we going to arrange UX and UI to help deliver on those goals? Um, and the final one, market demand, um, is probably going to be shown through call to actions and completed UX steps. So proving that there is market demand for a product will be the interaction with call to actions, the interaction with completed UX steps that you've introduced in that MVP. So, um, Again, let's take the e-commerce example. It's, it's a nice straightforward one. Um, lots of people putting items in the checkout are gonna check out. So that isn't the call to action that you would measure. It would be if you change the checkout process, what you change and introduce, for instance, new products shown at the last moment, are they included in the basket and people still check out? So that would be the UX steps that you, you verify. So you need something to be able to measure those to prove it. Um, this is a bit of a wrap up. Um, I didn't actually time this, so we might be uh, we might be into a nice long Q and A discussion by the end of this. Um, a bit of a wrap up. So we can't easily demo um, MVPs. So I'm sorry I don't have a, a sort of live demo for for you. Um, I think in another presentation, given a bit more time, um, I would like to go into running those exercises with the whole team, um, explaining how to run a prioritization matrix session how to run user feedback sessions, how to um, arrange the backlog and, and, and make sure that we are always driving for the MVP and um, you know, taking all of those, uh, those other comments into account. So I'm, I'm afraid there's no big demo. Um, hopefully we've learned something that we can uh, build into future processes and uh, we can action on them uh, through those other uh, rehearsed exercises and then the clients. Um, the talent in building an MVP and also about doing real UX, um, you'll, you'll, you'll be able to in include UX in your, uh, in your bios by going through some of this stuff, even when you are um, a software developer, a programmer, not people who typically put them in, which would be business analyst or project manager or designer. You often get those people talking about UX, but the truth is 
developers should have real good UX knowledge and the UX knowledge and the MVP knowledge is sort of uh, very tightly twined together. Um, it helps you lead clients through the exercises, maintain the direction of the MVP, even when you are um, an individual in, in the group and it's not the area of your full responsibility. Um, even if the client wants a full product and has big budgets, they should still be trying to start with MVPs. And um, there is something that I'm gonna demo. It's, uh, it's not something I've prepared, but I think it is a very good example. And um, I might have shown this to people before. This is um, Nordstrom, what they've defined as their uh, MVP. And it's actually what you would call a design sprint. And it's a little bit different from an MVP. Uh, it's like an MVP on steroids. And there are people doing this at the moment, and it is insane. <laughs> it's really insane. They get very close to the users in the moment that the users are doing the thing they're going to address. They work really quickly, and they create and recreate in rapid cycles of hours or days. Um, provide something that is usable as quickly as they can. Um, one sprint, you're talking about a one sprint design sprint not at the end of an mvp project just one sprint and um, they also find out things much faster by being there with the users and um, there's a really great example of that but i'm not going to spoil it because if you've not seen this before um, they can explain for you so um, you guys just tell me if this uh, works all right in the video streaming and hopefully um, you can all see it We can't seem to hear it, but we can see it. You can't hear it? No. Okay, let me see if I can just adjust my uh, video. Mm -hmm. Bear with me. Sorry about that. There is, uh, uh, there is, um, select microphone microphone option and you probably can play some of the settings there. Um, cool. Let me uh, try that again. Tell me if you hear this, okay. No? No. No? Maybe you can try to uh, use your speaker phones instead of AirPods. Um, one moment. Yeah, let me uh, just disconnect these. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, it's all yeah. fine. Okay, now let's see what happens. Okay. I'm JB Brown, the Nordstrom Innovation Lab Manager. This is the lab. We work on one week experiments. Somebody will have an idea and we'll find a way to figure out how to prove if the idea is going to work. And this week, the Innovation Lab is going to be building an iPad app with customer feedback as we go through the week. We wanted to work in the store to make sure that we were getting customer feedback as we worked so that we were never working on anything that wasn't valued by the customer and only doing things that were really valuable. So we'll be building a feature and testing it until we get to the point where we have something that's good enough that we can just leave and leave the iPad app behind and have this new thing that customers can use. This is the world's first flash build. It's a flash mob where a software team shows up and builds an application in a surprise location. This is the Nordstrom Innovation Lab and we're at the flagship store in downtown Seattle. Right now the team is just setting up their equipment to get started. We're going to build an iPad app that helps customers pick the best pair of sunglasses for them. We really don't know what the features are yet. We're going to use customer feedback as we go along throughout the day and the rest of the week in order to build the best thing. So the next thing we're going to do is a user story map. So we're going to sit here and together outline all the steps that a customer take and actually even beforehand how they buy some process, like what are the different things that they might do and how that process might change if we have this application. And we'll actually dig into what we have to build in order to support that process. So now that we've done a card mapping, we're going to do a paper prototype. And this is something that we commonly do in the innovation lab. It's a great way to show what we'd like to do in a rough 
software type that we can easily throw out, change, alter, based on feedback from the customers. I'll continue building individual paper slides and our user experience specialist at Mattel will bring the prototype to a customer and say, okay, I have this app and this is a paper version. I'd like you to kind of use it like you would normally use an app and you can press things, interact with them, and then she'll change out the pages based on how the customer uses it. So it's a similar experience to the iPod, only an analog version. So it's day two and we have our first working prototype of this app and how it works is I take my first pair of sunglasses, put it on, the picture, all right, and then I want to compare it to this other pair I've got right here. Take these on, take another picture, I can just hold these up like this and see which one I like better. Well, Tell and Kim, having talking to people and doing paper prototypes, we've been coding, building an iPad. We take a stab at something, we look at paper prototypes that they put together. We might take one at a time. Usually we come to the board and we grab the most important feature and we start implementing it. The really cool thing with this flash build is that we have actual real customers. Just today we delivered four or five different separate features and I've delivered it and swap the iPad and tell. She would go and talk to a customer. And 10 minutes later I had feedback from real customers about this thing that I delivered and it changed how we did the next thing. And it's been really, really great watching day to day what they've been doing, the team to get all the feedback from the salespeople, the feedback the salespeople have gotten from the customers. And it's a really interesting process to kind of come in. On Tuesday, we had no idea what this would look like. There's an idea that somebody had to say, if people take a lot of pictures of themselves with the sunglasses, it'd be cool if we could show them side by side to help them make the process better. And that was the idea. That was it. They came in, they had nothing built, and they've been building this literally on the spot throughout each day. And by now, we actually have an app, a functioning app that they can go through. It's very intuitive to help look at themselves and make the sunglass selection process easier, which is pretty cool to watch. So yesterday, the sunglass buyer from North Carolina came down to check out our progress. He happened to put on polarized glasses. I'm just going to make a point of um, concentrating on this. I believe this is something you would only get in a design sprint where you're there with the users in the moment going through those rapid release cycles. So he's going to talk about um, a user that came in and, and what happened with that user. It's easier, which is pretty cool to watch. So yesterday, the sunglass buyer from North Carolina came down and checked out our progress. And she happened to put on polarized plastic and then pulled up the iPad and reports review and was surprised that she couldn't see anything in the black. We figured out that polarization of the iPad running up and down and the polarization of the glasses running vertical cancel each other out. You don't see anything. But if you turn the iPad to landscape, you see perfectly fine because of the polarization of the two items line up, and it's okay. So it was a pretty good find to be in the store, and she just happened to put on polarized lens. So today, first thing we're going to do is switch it to a landscape design, and then lock in the aspect ratio of the iPad, so customers, salespeople, just naturally pick it up and use it in landscape and not try and go to the portrait. Okay, so I'm going to show you what we've been working on the last five days. We've added quite a few features of the week. Take a picture multiple pictures of the customer, and then tap them up, tap the first one, you can see it uh, larger, and then tap the second, and do a side-by-side -side comparison of each class next to each other. We also added a feature where you can rename the picture, because we heard from salespeople, if a customer's trying on quite a lot of glasses, it's helpful to be able to know what order they were taken in, and also rename if you want with a brand or some distinguishing feature about the class. Another feature we added was the ability to zoom. You can zoom in and really get a good detailed look at the frame side by side. Also, to see one of the pictures larger, if you want to just better view of one frame, you can flip the camera view as well. Face it forward so the salesperson can take a picture of it like this, or you can flip the camera. So, take the picture of uh, yourself facing it. And then at the end of it all, we have a button called New Customer, which just erases all of the images and allows the salesperson to start with a new customer. We're just trying to put the final touches on the app. Tell talks with a lot of users, and they said that when we went into the compare view, it was unclear where the pictures were coming from and which picture was which. So the animation here is trying to solve that problem, make it a little more clear what's going on. One of the challenges in the software is what you've done, right? And I think the answer is really it depends on how much time you have. At least the most important things got done. So this was time boxes for the week, and we did a week's worth of work. And it seems like what we have now is something that makes customers happy and addresses the main problems, and it's something that we can track and metrics on. So I think we're gonna call that a day.
the application has developed so far. Everything's finished, everything that we've asked for, and even the little roadblocks and glitches that we kind of stumbled across as we use the app during the week has been solved. I think that it's going to be really easy to be able to implement into our sale. And I think we're going to find a lot of success with the application, whether it's via a selling tool for us or if it goes public into a downloadable format, whatever happens, we generally find success. So that's that. I think, um, yeah, thanks Thanks for, for watching the presentation. Um, open to questions. Um, I might not be able to answer them all, but uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was fun researching and, and doing the presentation with you guys. Yeah, thanks for the presentation, Anthony. That's very, very interesting to see it once again, maybe from just a little bit different angle. Um, you know, all these concepts, just from my experience, I guess, uh, all those concepts, a bit hard to follow strictly when you're working with a client who doesn't know these concepts, you know, who's not following them strictly. The client's more like, well, the window product done. Just tell us, like, we can define the business values and then you, business priorities, I mean, and then you just sort of define how you want to run, how you want to go about this, and obviously want everything and now. And then it becomes really hard, so you, you need to start almost fight the client for literally every story, which is uh, making its way into the sprint. So the real life sometimes breaks these concepts. I mean, not breaks them, probably, but um, the better way to say it, it's, you, from one side, you know the theory, how it should work, because it's going to work beautifully. And if you aim for MVP and so on. But from the other side, there's clients who are not trained to do this. So the question is, I suppose, is how to make sure that, you're that we follow this MVP approach properly with every client we have who might be not trained well to, or might not be interested in following certain approaches or like tend to follow, like says that he's interested, but in reality, they want everything in now. How to deal with yeah. this? Yeah, I think um, it's, it's a very good point. Um, you, you already yourself started talking about the consequences of not following it. So they want everything now, it has to be this, why isn't it on budget, et cetera, et cetera. These are all things that are factored into doing MVPs. So they say, we're worried it's gonna go over budget. You say, okay, I can help you reduce the risk. This helps reduce risk. Um, it has to be on time. You say, okay, well, let's reduce the risk of it going over time by trying to build fewer features in at the beginning. Um, they talk about their business goals. We say, well, let's, uh, let's confirm that there is product market fit and let's confirm that earlier on to reduce risk to go forward. I think um, what you're describing is very waterfall. People who say, I've got this big idea and I want it X and there is no room for movement. And as long as we continue to push Agile and um, explain why Agile would be the natural winner, um, Agile very much suits MVP. And the rest of it is um, how you explain the rationale, how you get closer to the client and closer to the client's end users so that you can show things to the client about their users that they don't know. And if you can get that far, then it's not a subjective input thing anymore. It's data from the users about what the users want or what we have shown to work in MVPs. I would say that's the, the sort of approach. To it. But yeah, no, I hear you. How do, how do you think should define what is MVP, what is not? It should be done by a client, right? Well, it, it, it's more like the product owner. And the product owner can exist in the client side of the team, and it can exist in the agency side of the team. Um, but eventually the product owner sort of answers to the stakeholders. And so the stakeholders do need buy-in, but the PO should decide what is in an MVP. And it, like one of those terms I used from the beginning, constraints, you have to explain why you're introducing constraints, where you're introducing constraints, and the importance of constraints at all, because otherwise everyone's imagination runs wild. And as you say, they want everything now for less money with no risk 
on time, et cetera, et cetera. And in, when, whenever you hear those parts of the conversation, you just have to sort of reel them in a little bit. You just have to bring them back down to earth. You say, these are great ideas. We're going to put them with all the other ideas and judge them the same way that we're judging all the other ideas. And let's try to measure if these ideas are sensible to go forward with. Yeah, it's a good point about product owner that he's or she's responsible for it. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting how we can start assigning value to stories, to features, because at the moment uh, we have estimations, which uh, explains how hard it will be for the development team to implement feature, but there is no uh, no marker of how valuable this particular feature can be. Yeah. Yeah. In, uh, looking at the prior prioritization matrix, I'd really like to figure out a way that we can have for every new, uh, maybe on an epic level or something which is a feature, a way that we simultaneously add it to um, to be put into the prioritization matrix as well as our uh, product ice box. And so at the same time, we're saying, we're, we're gonna start talking about this thing, these new ideas, these new features. We say, okay, let's figure out how to prioritize it. And we prioritize it through the prioritization matrix, not just through what the stakeholder might want, because what the stakeholder might want might not be based on value that we can show. They might not be able to show it, we might not be able to show it they might not have considered uh, what the estimate would be in terms of effort, and that isn't just a developer's effort. Uh, do you think this MPA, MPA, uh, uh, this approach can be applied to any projects? I'm talking about the clients who like has fixed budget uh, and uh, he would like to have all features to launch the site? Yeah, so um, fixed budget stuff and waterfall projects. Um, what I often tell clients who want to think that way is um, I tell them what everyone else will do when they're asked for a fixed, a fixed price. And if you're an agency and you're asked to provide a fixed price, you have to factor in all the risk because you're taking all, all the risk. So you inflate the real cost of doing something. Maybe it's not a thousand euros, it's you're gonna charge 1,500 or 2,000. So you inflate the cost a lot because you're taking all the risk. And then if it does only cost a thousand euros, the client is overpaid by 500 or a thousand euros, right? And so I try to explain that to people who want to think in terms of fixed cost. Also, if you do have a fixed cost, but you're variable on scope, which is fine. Like uh, we've had clients that have got very strict budget caps, that is understandable. Then the, the nature of um, trying to avoid risk through prioritizing becomes even more important. So you say, okay, imagine we get to the end of the project and the budget is gone. What, a, a, another way of talking about this is Moscow, like what you must have, should have, could have, and won't have in the product, Moscow. And so you, you get them to think through prioritizations and say, okay, let's go from the, what there must, it must include and try and get them to think in terms of priorities so that by the end of the project, if the budget runs out, you've included all of the must-haves, most of the should-haves and could-haves and none of the won't-haves. And so you, you, you try and get through all of your priorities and then the rest is not a big deal. And most people in business can stomach the idea of, minor letdowns. If they have to, if they have to uh, stomach something, they, they want to be let down on small things. They don't want to be let down on the really big important stuff. So you prioritize with them and you get them to go through prioritization even on big projects. I've got a real, real life example. Maybe you Anthony can walk us through this small exercise. So we've got a client, uh, with, uh, we're implementing a lot of features for that client. And one of uh, features is 
very well known, um, social sharing buttons. Obviously, the site can uh, work without social sharing icons. You can open a website, you can copy URL of this page and send it to a friend or share in Twitter. So uh, from my point of view, uh, it is not a mission critical feature. But at the same time, client thinks that it is must have for, uh, for the site launch. How to discuss this kind of things? Yeah, so um, you need to get into the uh, the sort of the psychology of introducing all of these ideas from the beginning and not just bring them up when you want to contest one particular feature. So from the start of the project, you should be building things this way, getting them to really sign up to Agile, getting them to really sign up to an MVP, and also pushing back or, or reining people in every time they mention something which contradicts the MVP or contradicts Agile. And so trying to pile in features before a launch is a non-MVP, non-Agile way of doing things, right? Um, trying to introduce features in a subjective way, well, where's, where, where's the evidence towards how that feature is being prioritized? Because what they're saying is it's must have, right? So it's in, in the prioritization matrix, if I scroll back a bit, um, they're saying it's up here. Like as soon as these things are done, they're like moving something way up here instead of it would be one of the last things we try and do. And if, if you only introduce these uh, concepts when it's a feature you want to contest, it's probably not going to work very well. Um, you, you might be able to introduce them at any time, but it depends how receptive the client is. And one of the better things would be to ask for some data behind some of those decisions. And you obviously, it, it, it becomes very diplomatic the way you manage clients, but um, you want to point out that things shouldn't really be based on subjective input and there should be data and evidence to support their hypothesis. Because their hypothesis is people will use that share button to share things. Now, if they have their own data already, from a previous site build that says 2% of people used a share button and 50% of people on the site shared at some point. Well, that proves that the share button doesn't really go much way to sharing. Um, that's if they've got their own data. You could go and find other data that shows that other sites who've got a share button are shared often and the sharing doesn't occur through the button. So, you know, that th there would be other ways to introduce it. Um, and I think the best thing is to come to the table with some form of data or evidence if you want to uh, take a bit of a stand on an issue. Thanks. Um, another example, uh, slightly different. Imagine we've got a, um, a plan of a product with five features and each feature takes appro approximately a day to uh, complete. So it's a week, uh, a one week project. And if we think in terms of MVP, only free, uh, we can launch with free features. So in three days. Uh, but communication and discussion and all this uh, data gathering stuff, this exercise around uh, preparing MVP and uh, providing proper, uh, giving proper value to each feature, it takes another two days. So in result, uh, in case of MVP, we uh, spent more time in communication and doing some data analysis and complete a uh, project in five days. In case if we don't do anything like this and just complete five features, we also finish the project in five days. Yeah, so <clears throat> what you're talking about is whether you're actually gonna launch an MVP or whether you're going to launch whatever you think is, like whatever's been given to you. It, it's, uh, there's a difference between being intellectual and being able to establish with the client whether what they're doing is a good idea or just being told what to do and you become like a machine. And so we want to remain in the intellectual side and we want to say, Great, can you, can you tell us why you're doing the thing? And how do you even know if you're doing the right thing? 
And if they say, ah, I'm glad you asked, we've got a proof of concept here, or we've got a prototype there, we've got um, people working with us in terms of UX or market research, we're gonna run a focus group, um, that there is data from different uh, places like outside organizations that are helping out, that's a good starting point. If you're just brought a project and you don't start with, tell me the background to the project, it's probably a bad start. And um, in, in, your, in your example, if you've got um, uh, th three days of development to build three features instead of five, calling it an MVP, what, how, how did you prioritize those features? And if you prioritize them in a way that they're the most important things to prove your hypothesis, to prove product market fit, to prove UX, uh, usability engagement, and <clears throat> to, to benefit the business, that's great. If, if there's a good reason those three have been chosen, that's great. But you still want to spend the extra time because it will be less risk to go through this process and launch something which has a good uh, like data-driven understanding of what you're trying to do rather than just cram in as much development as you can but no one's prioritized properly no one's going to measure properly no one asked what the real business case was before they started and so the, the other example is uh, five days of development where you're throwing shit at a wall and hoping something sticks is the phrase and uh, the other example is strategic so it's still, it's still better to take a client and say, uh, th this is actually um, echoed by a lot of developers themselves as well. They say development isn't difficult. Managing projects is difficult. And deciding what goes into projects is difficult. So everyone knows that that's the hard thing to overcome. We're just highlighting that that is the difficulty in all projects. And this is the better way to run those, that the more difficult thing to overcome. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> thanks, thanks, uh, Anthony, for the presentation. Very I interesting. Don't, I don't mean to say all programming is, is easy. I, I know it isn't. I believe what's the most important, generally, in the talks like that is not trying to find a silver bullet because we will not find it. Different clients, different projects, different requirements. It's more about being aware of different uh, possibilities. And for some clients, we need to apply this pattern. For another one, if you have heard like this presentation, you may want to go with MVP first because this client, it'll work better for this particular client. It's more like being aware of how to handle different projects and different clients. This is, I guess, the key message in talks like that. Well, for, for me, I think it applies to everything. I think an MVP first approach is right for everybody and you just have to choose how you're going to introduce it, how you're going to structure it differently depending on clients. So some clients are going to be very receptive and some clients will need a bit more work. And then you're back to how hard it is to implement things because the easy, easy client or difficult client getting on board with MVP is actually the, the difficult part. Other, otherwise you're ending up taking a lot of risk on yourselves by just saying, oh, we're being given this set of requirements and we're a machine and we'll deliver it to you. And you're taking all the risk on yourself. So it's an unhealthy thing for an agency or, or even freelancers to do. Uh, I have one question. Uh, what to do in cases when we migrate a uh, project from old platform to new pl platform and um, uh, all project has rich amount of, of features and uh, yeah we can we can uh, ex uh, <clears throat> explain how cool mvp approach for our customer but users will still see uh, will still expect same amount of features yeah it's a very good question i don't really have um the perfect answer to that i don't i don't think i know the um the right answer and it might be on a case-by-case -case basis I can say what I have seen with some other um, agencies, they've actually delivered a stripped down version of previous features. So um, there's a, a famous charity called War Child and their design is very good. Their, um, uh, their community engagement is very good. Uh, they do really important work. 
and um, Wartel had their donation pages redesigned. And they only redesigned that one bit, so that does make that one bit an MVP uh, re-release, right? And what they did is they released fewer features. They released something much cleaner, loads of white space in the design. It looked great. It worked faster. It, it was a better product because they removed things. Um, I think with some clients, you're right. They do want all the bells and whistles. If someone at Facebook says, I've got this idea, let's re-release Facebook and do only a third of what Facebook currently does, they get fired. Um, but, you know, I, I think you have to, you have to listen to uh, what the users want. And it's fine to take a slice of a re-release and just re-release one part. So if you're a charity website, you could just re-release the donation forms, just re-release the landing pages, just re-release um, the homepage, well, maybe not the homepage, the news section, and take that one thing and treat it like an MVP. And, it, and you should push that out quickly, good time to market, focus on time and cost, get your metrics, and allow it to evolve after the MVP. Uh, maybe as an option, we can uh, launch MVP product, but let users uh, use old features on old platform. Yeah. Uh, it's in the age case maybe, but it, it would be cool if we can run a new project, but some features will be available on old platform. Yeah, so an example of that would be um, setting up a beta dot subdomain and um, majority of traffic goes to the normal domain. Give some beta audience users a chance to use the beta and help get feedback from those users, either autom automated feedback like a mechanical, uh, like machine stuff, or um, user generated feedback for you. And at some point, switch to making the beta the default and allowing people to roll back if they want to manually override and use the old platform. And eventually people just start using the beta and it's not a, uh, you know, it's, it's not political, it's not difficult. Uh, yeah, also as an example of this meetup.com site, when uh, you can use new interface, but some features like photo gallery uh, is available in old interface. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and that might be, looking at this prioritization matrix, is because some of these things in the last area or the never area, like you, once you've got this, like um, not necessarily over 50% of the features, but almost all of the features that are in the first and next bit, if they are all done or all almost done in your new beta product, that should be the time when you flip the switch and then gracefully degrade the other stuff or you know, a manual override for just those small things which are, were high effort to implement, difficult to implement and slightly less value. So you leave it as is. If you can't approach idea G over here, because although the value is high, it's super difficult to do. You're going to leave that until you've done this other stuff. Uh, it doesn't mean you'll never get around to it. Um, at some point, someone will put more money on the table to make that happen because they know how difficult it is, but it isn't something you would prioritize at the beginning. Are we happy to, to wrap up? I know we've got um, another meeting shortly after this. Yeah. I think uh, uh, it's time to stop recording. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Thanks, Andrew. I think I'll do my next lightning talk, like building on this. So my next one will just be a 10 or 15 minute talk on the same topic, but maybe just one or two exercises that we can learn. Cool. Thank you.